Well, let's take a look at what this actually looks like. What can I do with it? Now, I've seen people wrestle with this. You actually do not need to go and get yourself a compiler for assembly. You don't have to use NASM or anything like that. You certainly can. There's nothing wrong with that. However, you could even use GCC. I'm using this on Linux, so that's what I'll use here. If you use, run GCC against a, an assembler file, something that ends in .s, it will know how to compile that with no problem. I've added a dash C option here because what I'd like it to do is turn this into object code. I don't want it linked. The reason I do that is so that I could, excuse me, I can then dump out the object code and retrieve the actual bytes that make up that code. Here's what I'm talking about. When I write objdump-d against that object file that's just been created, you can see here that it shows me, here's all of the code that we just wrote, and then you can see over here on the left the actual bytes that comprise that code. That's what we're looking for. That code there is what we need. That's the binary portion of the exploit. This is our shell code. With that in hand, we can just copy the bytes. So you can see here in this example, we've used Perl to do it, Perl E, and we print simply using a bash slash x in front of each byte. We print each of the bytes that make up that shell code. So you see it begins here, B8322F. If you go back one slide, you'll see that it matches exactly, B8322F7368. 7368. So we just take the bytes one at a time, string them together, and then I'm going to print them off into an intermediate file. Some people seem to like to keep it all on the command line and bundle those things up. I prefer to move them into a file so that I don't have to rekey them every time. How long is that exploit code? Well, if we were to count it up, you'd discover that it's 28 bytes long. That's really very interesting when you think of it. We have 124 bytes to work with. We only need 28 to execute a shell. That means we've still got a lot of room to work with. We could have done much more with this exploit, but we're going to limit it to what we have so far. We need to keep in mind how many bytes of code we have, though, because that number is going to be used to determine the actual return address. Let's see how we go about doing the manual exploitation. So what we have, we've got some knowledge of the flaw, we've got some shell code in hand, and all we need now is to launch the exploit. How can we do that? We've actually already got the tools. It turns out that we can bundle it up and either create a, a you know, single freestanding exploit, or if we're just interested in, in doing some proof of concept, for instance, if I'm developing this for something to use in Metasploit later, I don't really need to create a prepared binary. Instead, I just need the proof of, proof of concept, perhaps using something like Netcat. Because if I can exploit it with Netcat, I can very easily turn it into a Metasploit exploit. So let's see how we go about doing this. What we know is we have a 124 byte buffer. We know that the ESP is pointing to the beginning of the, uh, of the stack at that point, or the top of the stack, which is where our buffer is. We know that our shell code is 28 bytes, which means that we've got 96 bytes left over. What do we do with the rest of those bytes? Now, there's some different strategies. We could try to take our exploit and put it at the beginning of that buffer so that when we try to return, we're returning directly to our code. But usually, there's going to be some variances that we find on different architectures with other processes running, things like that. It can end up moving those things around a little bit, maybe some different circumstances in the application. So as a result, it's better practice generally to pad out with something else, like any, any single byte unimportant instruction. It really doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's not redirecting operation. The easiest one to use is NOP, but if you used other ones, you can imagine that many intrusion detection systems actually look for NOP sluts. That's what they're called. It allows you to come in on your code and then just sled on over, slide on down to where your actual exploit is at the end of the buffer. You could use any single byte instruction, which would make it much, much harder to find. Let's see how we can go about launching this exploit. So what we've got over here, exit out of this, and let me restart my server. Right. So what I've got here in this directory, I've already taken and put some of the information into uh, or onto the system here. 
I've got the exploit, uh, let me find it here, the shellcode raw. So this shellcode raw, if I look at the size of it, you'll see that it's just 28 bytes. That's the actual shellcode. I then also have this knob sled. The knob sled is 96 bytes. All I did was use Perl to print, um, just for safety, let me print it this way. That's all I did. So we've now printed that knob sled. It's a whole bunch of 96 hex, hex uh, 90s. And finally, the address. Now the address you'll see here is four bytes long. What I've printed in for the address is this value right here, BFFFED50. Where did I get that from? Well, that's where 738B0, that's where we ended up at the end, but the beginning of that buffer, where our stack actually began, was here. So I've used this address, BFFFED50, to represent where we are now. So I've taken all of those pieces. Well, let's, let's put them together here. We can take the knob sled plus the exploit itself, so the shell code, plus the address, and we can put that all into exploit POC. And that file ends up being 128 bytes long. Now you may hear that number and say that sounds a little off. It's actually not. Remember that we had 124 bytes to the return pointer. Then we just put the address where the return pointer will be, and that brings us out to 128 bytes, a 4-byte memory address. So if we simply take this, this code, this data, this binary value, and we cat it through netcat to 127.001 on port 7777, notice what's happened. I now have a command prompt waiting here, and notice we have the root command prompt back in the server. So at this point, we have now manually able to, been able to create a proof of concept demonstrating a flaw in this application and actually created shell code and exploited it. The next step would be, once we've got that proof of concept, how do I turn that into something that I can run on Metasploit? And that's what we're going to take a look at in our next section.